All right, in this video, let's get our screen progression put into place. So here in code, we've already got our main menu set up, and we've got all of the screens that it's trying to invoke, where single player and multiplayer are trying to invoke select. Now, of course, if we run the game right now, we'll just get error messages saying that select and free play don't exist. So the very first thing we need to do is to put together these screens. Now again, the screens themselves are going to begin as simply being empty. Mm -hmm. We're going to get the screen by screen progression put together first, and then we can address whatever we need in these specific screens. So looking over here to our menus folder, let's put three new classes together. For the first class, we will make a screen, or rather, let's see, looking through here we have screen select score and game. Now as far as menus go we have screen select as the first one. We have another menu and that's the score screen. So we'll add a class for screen score. Mm -hmm. And the last screen we were talking about was the actual game screen. And I'm going to add that class to the game folder because the game screen is not actually going to be a menu. It's just a normal screen. So inside of the game folder, we will have screen game. All right, now that we have three brand new screen classes, we need to do some basic setup on all three of them. We'll need to add in our standard using statements, so we have access to XNA types, and we will put in some basic input handling code to let us do simple forward progression using select and backward progression using the back button. So beginning over here inside of screen select, let's clean up the subname space. Let's grab some using statements, and I'm going to conveniently steal some from screen main. We'll grab our standard XNA framework and framework.graphics using statements and drop them into select and into screen score and into screen game. And then as we work our way back through, I'll pull out the sub namespace out of each. So pulling out of screen game, screen score, and screen select we already took care of. Now, for the screen classes themselves, screen select and screen score will both be menus where a screen game will just be a normal screen class. So, screen select will need to extend screen menu. Screen score will also extend screen menu. And screen game will simply extend screen. Alright, so moving back to screen select, let's put in some basic input handling that will let us jump screen to screen. So inside of screen select, we will override the input pressed method. And at this point, this is a menu screen, so we'll make sure that we leave our call to base.input pressed so that menu navigation will continue to work. And we need to look for either back or select. So we'll put together an if statement and we'll check input data. And if input data dot named input is equal to named inputs dot back, then we'll just pop the screen. Exactly. So in order, if you remember back to the stack based screen management architecture, all we have to do to get back to the neck or to the last screen is pop the current screen off the stack. So we'll say screen. So we'll look into the static screen class or static method of the screen class, where we can call the pop screen management method. And what's interesting is calling pop screen is actually going to take us off the stack looking at us as a screen select. Mm -hmm. Now, if the user hit the select button instead, we'll need to progress forward. We'll drop in an else if here. And once again, look into input data. See if the named input is equal to named inputs dot select. And if that is indeed the case, then we'll need to progress from the song selection screen to the game screen. So we'll call screen dot push screen, and we'll tell it that the screen we want to advance to is the game screen. And looking at that, for now we can leave the progression as simple as that. 
again we just have our back navigation and our select navigation now I'm going to copy this if statement here inside of input pressed and I'm going to jump over to screen score and do the same thing we'll override input pressed we'll leave our call to base.inputpressed and we'll paste the if statement so from screen score we'll have back pop the screen and I know this will cause a little bit of a difference because on the whiteboard we had drawn where the score screen goes all the way back to song select mm -hmm. but we'll address that once we get some some of the basics running so we know that we'll need to go farther than one screen back we'll also know that from the score screen hitting select well that's actually going to have some options to it mm -hmm. so we'll need more menu items to truly handle this again for now and for the sake of simplicity this is just going to jump straight back to select now we can look at the game screen and once again we will override the input pressed method since this is just a regular old screen I'll pull the call to base.input pressed out since it's not going to be doing anything in this case then we can paste in our if statement from the game screen we'll let back pop the current screen and drop us back at the song selection screen and that will directly match the whiteboard progression mm -hmm. then if we hit select well in the game screen normally you'd wait for the game to end in this case we haven't coded a game into the game screen so we'll let the select button simply push us over to score so then looking at these screens you could say chronologically if you will you would go from select select would push game from game game would push score and from push score we'll need to make a more complex decision but for now score pushes us back to the beginning which is select okay so now we've got kind of a loop so with that now let's actually jump in and see what this is looking like because if you remember the main menu is still pushing the select screen and actually what will happen is well you'll see what happens if we try and run the game now we would expect the next screen to be select in actuality we still get the message saying that the select screen doesn't exist in this case it's not so much that it doesn't exist as a class it's that it doesn't exist in that screen's dictionary right. it hasn't been added to the list yet so that means before we can use our shiny new screens we have to go back here to the game class and inside of load content we were setting up screens and we're seeing that this was the line that was used to register the main screen we instantiate it but we immediately take that new instance and add it to the screen's dictionary under the given name so now we need to do that for select as well so we need to do that for let's see three more times well one will be for select for game, game and for score. score gotcha so that's just populating that dictionary exactly that's saying don't just uh, create the screens but also remember that we can reference them by name so that will be main we'll have an entry for the game screen for the select screen and for the score screen now of course we want to store the right kind of instance under each one so the game will actually need to be a new instance of screen game select will need to be an instance of screen select and score will need to be a screen score so the, this should get all of those loaded up and dropped into the list <coughs> excuse me also keep in mind that we still have our automated background loading loop in place which means that each of these will get considered inside of the loop and if they have a relevant background texture again looking at things like screen underscore game will match the name game mm -hmm. and so on so now if we run from single player if we hit select we now get the select screen nice and what's interesting is even though we haven't coded any we haven't put any draw code whatsoever into the select screen we're just leveraging the fact that backgrounds get automatically loaded right. and our development backgrounds note which screen we're currently on so from select we could or excuse me from the select screen we could hit the select button and progress on to game Very from nice. game we could hit the select button and progress on to score so our system is working and if we hit the select button one more time we wrap back around to ooh very interesting like I was saying we need some more complicated we need some more intricate code to handle options mm -hmm. and look what happened trying to get a little bit too push happy 
and try to jump to a screen already on the stack using push means we tried to push the screen a second time. Right, which we wrote kind of a custom exception for that. Exactly. So we can see that there at the bottom of our log attempted to push select, which is already on the stack, right. indicating to us that ah, we need to go about this more carefully. So let's do just that. Looking at the score screen, or, or excuse me, one last thing I want to show is that the back button from score we can hit back, go back to game, back to select, back to the main menu, and then if we hit escape altogether, exit, exit out of the game. Nice. So that was a simple, again, that's not matching the whiteboard exactly, but that's showing we can progress forward through screens and backward through that's screens. A, that's a fair portion of what we showed on the whiteboard. We just need to get a little bit more intricate and get all of those loops put in place. So let's start with screen score. We know that obviously we can't jump back by pushing forward. So let's go ahead and put together the full um, menu items that will exist on that screen and code those menu items in so that they navigate to their correct locations. So jumping here inside of screen score, let's begin with the items themselves. We'll put two menu items in place. And we'll do this the same way we did on the main menu. We'll drop in a public constructor. So public screen score. And inside of screen score, we'll look into the inherited item names list from this dot item names. We will add to that list a few items. First, we'll add an option called replay. This could also be replay song. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to immediately jump back into the game with the same song. We'll add a second item, so item names add. We'll call this item change song. Which on the whiteboard I think was new song, but that doesn't really matter. Exactly. That's, that was just showing the, uh, the Whichever you prefer. So, and, and in the end, the same thing. Yeah. So we've got two items we'll add into place. And now we'll take a look at drawing those items. So let's jump in here below input pressed and override the draw menu item method. Inside of draw menu item, we'll remove our call to base dot draw menu item. And let's begin gathering some information. Let's do the same thing we did in the main menu. Let's grab a local variable called text and set that to be the name of the current item. So this dot item names sub item index. Now with our new text variable, we'll also measure the text that would be drawn if we were using the large font. Store that in a vector2 called text dimensions. So vex vector2 text dims will be equal to style. We'll grab font large and we will tell it to measure a string. We'll pass in text to measure string and that gets stored back out in text dimensions. Now we'll add a position. Once again, we'll copy one of our style positions into a local variable. So vector2 position will be style dot rather style positions dot score select. So looking through here, we have score players and then score select. Now, when we go to draw each of these, it's, once again, the same thing. We've gathered all the information we need at this point. We're now ready to tell the sprite batch to draw a string. We'll draw using the font style dot font large. Text will be stored in the text variable. Position is the position variable. And color is the color parameter that's passed to us here in draw menu item. Now, we do need to move our position y each time we draw an item. So we'll take position dot y and we'll increment it by whatever item we're currently on. So we'll take in item index. We'll gain a height for that item index by multiplying it against text dimensions dot y. And just like we did on the main menu, we'll space these items the same. So we'll multiply by 1.5f and that should give us some nice half line spacing in between each item. Right. So let's see. Let's actually run the game at this point and see what we're getting. So we'll jump in. We'll hit select a few times to go from the select screen to the game screen. 
then finally to the score screen, and we can see that, ah, we do have options now. Yeah, we have some options. We just kind of need to position them on the screen a little bit. Exactly. So we can use the up and down arrows to select them so our base menu code is working perfectly. We just need to handle their positioning. Looking here inside of Draw Menu Item, we're getting that positioning from one of our style positions. So let's jump into the style XML file. And then we have score select listed here. So let's set up our score select position to be at a pixel value of 503 in X by 547 in Y. So now if we run the game and jump in all the way to score, we can see that the menu options are here at the bottom. And you can really put these wherever you wanted to. These are just numbers that we've got in right now that correspond with some graphics we're going to integrate later. Exactly. The big thing here was just to free up this top area of the screen for the actual score information that will end up being placed into this screen. Now, of course, we need to come up with the necessary input code since there is no select handling for those items. We still have the old one that's trying to re-push the select screen. So now that we have items we can select from, let's go in here under screen score and we'll set up exactly where these items are supposed to go. So here inside of our select input, instead of trying to push the select screen, let's pull that out all together. Since we know right off the bat in order to get, to get back to earlier screens, we're not going to be pushing anything. We'll be popping screens. Mm -hmm. And an interesting way we can optimize the code here is thinking about it, no matter what happens on the score screen, whether we go back a little bit or we go back a lot, we'll be going back at least one screen. So right off the bat, the moment we, uh, the moment we hit the select button, we'll go ahead and pop the current screen. So the moment we hit either of those, we now jump away from the score screen and this by itself would leave us at the game screen. Now leaving ourselves at the game screen would be correct if the replay option was selected. Mm -hmm. Now what we'll do, and that's where I was saying this would optimize the code a little bit, is we only need one if statement now. So we pop the screen, we go back to game, regardless. Now if we happen to have been on the change song option, we need to go further. We need to go one screen further to get back to the song selection. So we'll create an if statement saying if this dot selection index is equal to one, where zero would be replay and one would be change song. If we're to change song, we need to go one more screen back to get us from the game screen to the song selection screen. So we'll call screen dot pop one more time. So we have our call to pop screen. And so that should take us back. So either option will take us back. One option will take us one screen further back. So we can test this. We jump into the game, hit select a few times to get to the score screen. We can hit replay. Ah, very nice. No error messages down here in our log, and the game screen comes back up. Gotcha. So cool. progress back to the score screen, change song, the select screen. So select, game, score, back to game, back to score, back to select, back to score, and there's the loop. Or back to select, and then escape button back to main, and escape button to exit. Mm -hmm. So there we're starting to get some of the more intricate navigation that we had outlined. So, moving on from here, we need to address the back button handling on the games on the score screen. Because the back button was going back to the game screen, but we had outlined that this was supposed to go to the song selection screen. So all we're going to do is just jump an additional screen and mimic the case of what would happen if we hit change song. Because here in our select input, we simply pop the screen and then pop the screen again if it happens to be changed score. We can do the same thing for the back button, only we'll do that regardless. We're not, we won't look at the menu selection index to see which one to jump to. And just to make this code a little bit more clear, since if it had been a while since you looked at the stack-based operations of the screen system, right. it may possibly seem confusing to see the same method being called twice. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we'll drop some simple comments down to say that this pop takes us back to the score screen, or rather... So that would be the game screen, wasn't it? Right. I think what I was looking at here in my notes is that saying that's popping the score screen. Oh, I gotcha. So here's what we could do. We could say this goes score to game. Yeah. And From game to select. And the second one goes game select to indicate this is the progression that's happening. Mm-hmm. 
and then we'll jump in and test it just to make sure that we're seeing what we need to see from our score screen we can hit our back button or escape on the keyboard and jump directly back to select nice so that has our progression looking very nice the last thing we need to address is how to handle multiplayer state and on the whiteboard we simply noted that the multiplayer state is actually going to be stored in global state to make it accessible on a higher level than screen mm -hmm. and that will give the game screen the ability to see what it needs to see without having to pass player information down the chain of push screen calls so the very first thing we'll do is we'll go into global state and we will set up our fields I'll also collapse content at the moment give ourselves some more room then inside of game we have global state we'll load up this class jump in here at the very bottom of the class and we'll add some fields the first one is obvious it's just going to be a number of players so we'll put down the field let's see we'll put together a public field it will be static it will be an integer and of course the name is num players now we need a another field that we're going to use for the pot to add the possibility of expansion because at the moment it might seem it would be more efficient just to make a boolean value that said is multiplayer yes or no sure but we're going to leave ourselves open to make it easier to add more than two players in the future mm -hmm. even though this implementation of the drum game is only going to handle two players so multiplayer is the same thing as two player but what we'll do in order to make it a little less hard coded is we'll make a second field called max players so in the future if you wanted to extend the player capacity you could do so more easily and then any screen looking for the total number of players will have somewhere to look so we'll make a second field called public static int max players and we'll set that to be equal to two so again this implementation is only going to worry about two players but anything referencing max players will then be more easily adaptable to more players. So with these fields in place, now we can look at the screens that need to work with them. So we'll be looking at the main menu and the game screen. Inside of our main menu, or the screen menu class, what we need to do is to make sure that when we select multiplayer, which would be here in option index 1, we need to make sure that multiplayer sets our number of players to two. So before we jump into the select screen, let's take our global state num players and we'll set that equal to two. Now again, like I was saying, I don't want to hard lock anything to two in any of our uh, actual screens. Mm -hmm. So we'll actually set this equal to global state dot max players. So we get our num players set up for multiplayer. But now we need to handle what would happen if we hit single player. And rather than have single player change the number of players to one and multiplayer to two, we'll have anything except multiplayer set the number of players back to one. So that anything dependent on that value, things like maybe the recording screen, any other gameplay style screen, sure. won't get confused. So here, before we even look at the selection index on the main menu screen, we'll take our global state num players and set that to one so we default to one and then if we happen to hit multiplayer then we'll set that to max players which is two now we need to do something to indicate whether or not we're storing this value correctly because right now the game screen shows nothing so what we'll do is inside of screen game we'll add some temporary drawing code which will simply show our selected number of players so here inside of screen game we will override the draw method and inside of draw we'll add a simple sprite batch draw string call so we'll draw out some text and we'll draw this text using the large font so we'll reach into style once again and we'll grab font large the text we'll draw will be, let's put together some text using string.format. So string format, we'll put together a format string of argument zero players. And we'll put the S in parentheses. And then the value that we'll feed in will be global state dot num players. 
And since we're running out of space here on the recording screen, I'm actually going to take this whole string format line and let's move that to a local variable. We'll make a string called text and set that equal to our num player's text, just to make it a little bit easier to see. Okay. So as we're drawing our text, now we'll simply plug that in as the text local variable. We'll give a screen position using a new vector 2 so that we can position the text at 10 pixels by 10 pixels to give ourselves an offset. And then for the color, we can reach into style colors dot text normal, which I guess this is a little bit of a little bit heavy on the formalities for something that we're considering temp code. Mm -hmm. But yeah, nonetheless, it still works. It's it'll be short nonetheless. So looking at this, let's jump into the game now, and we'll leave single player selected. We'll hit enter, we'll get to the select screen, hit enter again, and we get to the game screen, but the game screen is currently indicating that we have one player. Nice. Now we could go in and, actually I shouldn't have exited just yet, um, we can go into multiplayer, get to the game, we have two players. Very cool. So we can jump back, single player, one player, back, multiplayer, two players. So we are storing the number of players and that is getting passed along to the appropriate screen. So we now have multiplayer state being handled correctly. So with these elements put together, that has accomplished our screen progression that we had designed. Okay, so where do we go from here? From here, we can move on to really some more uh, interesting topics in the, the upcoming okay. videos. All right, well then let's just move on.